welcome to our first salon, y'all. My name is Trinice. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and we're looking forward to a really dope conversation today. Um, before I allow folks to introduce themselves and we run through the program, I just want to kind of share that I'm a professor, right? And I know how annoying it is to talk to people all day, right? To look at people on Zoom, uh, Teams, WebEx, what is it, Cisco, right? There's so many different systems that we use. Um, we want folks to know that this is a very like informal conversation that's guided, right? We have a structure, but we want you to feel like free to ask us questions. Um, the way that we've tailored this conversation is towards the end, you'll be able to talk to folks. If you have any questions, share your thoughts, please feel free to also utilize the chat. I see folks like checking in, um, where they're from, sharing their pronouns. So that's the first thing I just wanted to start us off with is that, you know, we, it's COVID-19, right? And there's a reason that we're on a webinar and we're not in person, right? There's a reason why we're all fatigued, right? In this particular moment. And I don't think it's okay or possible for us to not acknowledge um, what has happened, right? And the millions of people that have been impacted by COVID-19 and the hundreds of thousands of people um, that have died right across this globe. Um, so welcome. If you're just joining in, I see people popping in. Um, again, my name is Trinice McNally. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the creative director for I Support Black Women, um, which is a new project supported by Virgil Abloh and Off-White. Um, and the program um, is geared to do many things, but in particular to support the work of Black women organizers, right? And also to build a school for Black feminist politics. So I'm going to turn it over to Jamie. She's going to talk to you about some community guidelines and how we're going to rock. Thanks so much, Trini. Thank you everyone for being here. So excited to have this conversation and this continued conversation on Black and Asian uh, solid feminist solidarities and particularly this conversation on immigration, violence, citizenship and solidarity. So my name is Jamie Swift. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of Black More Radicals and super honored to be a part of this conversation and also to be a part of the I Support Black Women campaign, um, which is, like Trini said, helping to raise money to open a physical location in Washington, D.C. for the School for Black Feminist Politics, which is the Black Feminist Political Education arm of Black More Radicals. So, so nice for everyone to be here. I just really want us to ground the conversation. Like this is, like Trini said, a safe space. So like I ground the conversations with Black More Radicals. We don't allow certain things to happen, right? So no racism, ableism, xenophobia, white supremacy, transphobia, we don't allow that here. And if you can't abide by that, uh, the Black discourse team will, uh, you know, put you out. So we just want to ground that uh, with, with that too. It's a safe space and also some community agreements that we can, you know, discuss and agree to. So first of all, people are, there's some words, you uh, know, content warning. Um, please be clear about, you um, uh, the words that you use, and also if you have something to say that may trigger someone, because we don't know what words specifically trigger people because we're all different, but um, just please pause or, you know, say content warning um, so that others can be aware of what um, um, the content that you're saying or the statements you're saying. Also, too, I'm just going to go down a list of agreements that we can agree to as a community. So use I statements, um, impact over intention, be present and take space when you need it. Remember your positionality. Be aware of yours and others' experiences, identities, privileges, and oppressions and how they impact how we all show up. Lessons leave and stories stay. And we will take comfort in silence when it happens. So I hope that we can all abide by those community agreements. And one thing I didn't add y'all, I see folks doing it already in the chat, um, is a land acknowledgement. So where I live in Washington, DC, it's Pamunkey territory and also Piscataway. Um, and I also understand that we always have to honor the labor and the exploitation of the black people, right? Enslaved Africans that have stewarded the land in particular in Washington, DC, right? A couple hundred miles away from the first arrival of enslaved Africans in 1619 in Jamestown. So it's important that we not only acknowledge indigenous folks, but also the folks who have also stewarded this land um, for over the last 400 years. Um, and if folks have anything else to add in the chat in terms of community guidelines, it looks like folks are okay. Uh, feel free to keep dropping your name um, and also your pronoun. And we are gonna move into some introductions of participants. And like I told you, this is a non-academic setting. I have to keep keep saying that because I'm really sick of them, frankly, right? And that's really important, right? Of why 
this project has been created. We think it's really important that political education is accessible to all kinds of people, right? Off-White is a fashion brand, right? Um, ran by a Black person, right? There are a lot of contradictions, right, in terms of organizing and capitalism and how we all come to this work. But the thing that we are all grounded in together is that if we are not clear, right, about alignment, we are not clear about the tensions that have occurred, in particular between Black folks, right, and Asian folks, we need to be clear and understand the solidarity. So I'm coming to this conversation um, not as a person that is a scholar, right, on this particular piece of content. And I think it's really important um, that organizers and scholars and activists approach conversations with ease and come with an excitement and curiosity about learning, right? Because everyone doesn't know everything. And if we wanted this to be an academic space, you know, we would have did it at our universities, right? That's exactly why we're trying to do this work here, because we understand that fashion, arts, and culture have a role, right, in terms of how we make interventions and social justice. And we don't want to keep talking to the same people, right? Because we know if we do that, we're not going to win, right? So we need to make sure that this uh, knowledge, this education, this discourse, this conversation um, is continued and it's accessible to all of our folks. Also, big shout out to Black Discourse. They are the folks that are also facilitating this conversation. Um, please check out their website. There are several, several, several videos, um, podcasts. Check out their Instagram and the creative design. All of it is rooted in shared political values and alignment. And we're all committed to ensuring, like I said, that political education is accessible, right? Because we know we won't win if we keep talking to the same people. Um, so I'm going to jump in and allow um, the different panelists to self-introduce themselves, and then we're going to jump into some questions. And anyone who wants to go, you know, just popcorn it, um, and yeah, we'll get started. All right, what's up, y'all? My name is Nana Brantuo. I am... <laughs> I am based in the DMV area. This is where I was born and raised, two parents from Ghana and Sierra Leone. I am currently teaching at GW. It's a dope course on decolonizing international education. So really getting at what, what is education as a project in particular as embedded within international organizations like the UN, um, the IMF, the World Bank, we get into all the weeds of it. Um, I'm also doing work with the Justice for Muslims Collective in DC. I'm gonna drop their Twitter. I really want y'all to follow them. It's dope work by dope Muslim women in particular who interrogate Islamophobia as it's gendered. And it's just excellent work that they have been doing um, in particular in the wake of COVID. Um, I'm writing right now with Amaka Studio, another dope um, initiative. It's a, um, focused on Pan-African womanhood. So I get to profile some dope women, feminist organizers, activists that I know and love and support their work. So that's been really just great work as well. And I'm a PhD candidate. Um, I don't really talk about my university like that. I don't really rock with them like that, but I love my work. <laughs> I really just interrogate Black international students past and present. Um, it's a really interesting history that goes real far back into the early 1800s um, and really looking in particular at Black immigrants at HBCUs and Black spaces, creating movements, creating friendships, creating communities, and also addressing tensions. So that's me. And thank you all for having me. Yeah, anyone feel free to jump in. I can go next. It's going to be hard to follow up on that one, but um, and I like I feel like I want to channel your energy because, you know, I um, I'm in New York City. I'm, you know, from Queens, New York, and um, I will say I've been working in New York City politics for the last five years. And it's funny that you say that you don't really, you know, highlight you know, being in academia, because I actually feel the same way in terms of, you know, Asian American Feminist Collective is my organizing space. And it's where I do the work that I want to do. But you know, I also acknowledge like I have been working in city government and the work that I do right now is actually working on COVID-19 um, and just testing and tracing in the vaccine work there. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, feelings around that too. So um, yeah, and I'm a writer and organizer. I predominantly do AFC work, but also um, passionate about, you know, where I grew up, Flushing and Bayside, New York. So doing a lot of organizing work in my neighborhood. And yeah. I can go next also. Um, I'm, I thought we were going to popcorn, Julie, but my name, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I'm Saloni. I use she and her pronouns. I'm also um, zooming in from New York City. I live in Upper Manhattan, so up in Inwood. Um, and 
I'm also a co-leader of the Asian American Feminist Collective and also a secret academic um, in here, but I'm gonna take off that hat fully. Um, I do identify as a historian fully um, and that work is really important to me. Um, I'm also a writer and uh, I do a lot of thinking about gender and sexuality and work um, and labor and immigration. Um, yeah, and I'll popcorn it to Trinice. Perfect, wow. Wow, the first popcorn so far. Hey y'all again, my name is uh, Trinice. I use she her pronouns. I'm originally from the United Kingdom by way of Jamaica, raised in Miami. Um, I serve as the founding director at the University of the District of Columbia. We are the first uh, department of its kind that serves LGBTQ students, um, undocumented folks, folks with different statuses and also first generation and formerly incarcerated folks. So yeah, I definitely like to push back on all the academic settings, but I really love the work I do, right? and the students I get to serve, predominantly at HBCU campuses, also a member of BYP 100, the Black LGBTQ Migrant Project, and also the Undocu Black Network as well, and really coming to this conversation in a place of learning and excitement, um, and also curiosity. And I will popcorn it to TD. Hi, um, I'm Tiffany. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm joining from Brooklyn or Lenape, unceded Lenape land. Um, and I am a co-founder and co-leader of the Asian American Feminist Collective, um, you know, along with Julie and Saloni. And um, in my, I guess, sort of career life, I'm a freelance journalist, um, editor and producer. And I typically cover topics surrounding um, identity, Asian American identity and issues, um, race, labor, sex work, um, et cetera, <laughs> uh, all the things. Um, yeah, and I'm just, you know, happy to be here. Thank you for holding this space for all of us. Um, I'll pass it to Jamie. Hey y'all, how y'all doing? My name is Jamie Swift, I use she, her pronouns. I'm in Piscataway land, but also known as Chocolate City, still known as Chocolate City, never forget it, okay. And I think Shay, Shay Queen said Chocolate City, yes. Um, so I, like I said before, I'm the executive director of Black More Radicals, which is a Black feminist advocacy organization. And we are dedicated to uplifting and centering Black women and gender expansive folks in Africa and the African diaspora. Um, it's hard talking about yourself. It's kind of weird. I'm going to say how I know everyone. So I know Nana because Nana, we work together on the Caribbean feminisms. Like Nana is the brainchild, one of the brain children of the Caribbean feminism series for Black More Radicals. Uh, Trinice, I interviewed Trinice and Nana for Black More Radicals and Trinice is just so dope and like runs a whole center. Lord have mercy, right? And just is like amazing. Julie, Saloni, and Tiffany, we met because we are co-collaborators on the Black and Asian Feminist Solidarities Project, which is a project that looks to the histories and contemporary struggles uh, for, sol for solidarity between Black and Asian feminists. And so, yeah, I'm just happy to be here, y'all. Um, I'm also quote unquote academic, but we ain't gonna talk about that no more, okay? Let's get into the conversation, y'all. Love y'all. <laughs> All right, y'all, so we're about to move right into our questions. Like I said, please don't hesitate to use the chat at any time it's being monitored. You can also hit us up directly even though we may not be paying attention. So if it is a question that you do want answered publicly, make sure you hit um, attendees and not just panelists because we may receive the questions and the folks that may also be sharing the same thoughts or curiosity may not have the opportunity um, to share that. So Jamie's gonna kick us off with our first question. We're gonna spend um, maybe the next 40 minutes or so being in conversation. Um, think of this kind of like as a fishbowl, right? Like we're all in this little glass, AKA my MacBook right here. And we're all, you have the opportunity to watch us, right? Be in conversation. And after that, you'll have the opportunity to ask us questions, um, to respond to things, but please utilize the chat um, and we will be following up with you directly. All right, Jamie, I'll let you kick it off and I'll jump right in. Yeah, sure. So I guess like what I love to ground conversations is like, how do we get here? You know, how did you come into your feminist consciousness and praxis? And I think that's important to show like we weren't born feminists, right? Like we had to come into this and get some political education. So if y'all didn't mind sharing, like, how did you come into your fem feminist praxis and consciousness? That would be cool. 
And don't be scared. Okay, just you just going y'all again. Yeah, don't be scared. Um, yeah, I feel like I came into mine feeling like um a survival, a survivor, sorry, of like patriarchal violence, honestly. Um, you know, I think what really brought me into the work was growing up seeing uh the ways that men oppress and you know commit violence against women and so i think whenever the ideas presented themselves to me uh you know because i don't think i necessarily went on a hunt for it you know uh, you know i'm sure i was like grasping at things like uh bikini kill and like riot girl feminism and stuff like that when i was younger because those things like appeared to me but every time i think they appeared to me i was drawn to them so the more and more like i came into like my political consciousness you know through um you know, whatever spaces, sometimes they were in higher education, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, other times, you know, just through connections that I made with other people um, that I just continue to like, try to learn and I'm still learning, you know, like we mentioned before, I'm definitely still on my journey. And, um, and but I definitely feel like I started to really like commit to and identify um, more strictly as like, I'm an Asian American feminist. Um, sometimes I want to shove the American part, but you know, um, you know, that I'm an Asian feminist um, was, I think, when we kind of all came together for AFC, um, you know, most uh, like kind of in the aftermath of the 2016 election and uh, early, you know, 2017, we can talk a bit more about our formation later. But um, yeah, I, I would say that that was actually like a much more like concrete, like concrete, to, I don't know, whatever, it made it more concrete for me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I, I'll just uh, cede my time here. <laughs> yeah, I also have a Bikini Kill connection, actually. Um, I totally feel like I moved to the US when I was eight from India, um, and I moved to LA. Um, and I definitely think it took me a little bit of time to figure out that like what I was feeling was not just like racial or cultural dislocation, but like dislocation within some of the ideas of like what gender was supposed to be or like how women were supposed to be. I was raised by a lot of very strong women who nonetheless like, you know, prescribed to some gender roles and like found themselves limited by what other people thought they should and shouldn't be doing. Um, and I think kind of similarly to Tiff, like feeling a lot of anger about that is sort of what got me to my feminism and yeah rock and roll and like that kind of like magazine DIY culture was really big for me I think also articulating why I felt so angry towards a lot of white women in my early life and like why that was like not a culture I felt uh, represented my like womanhood was really formative and sort of like identifying as a woman of color feminist and Asian American feminist like sort of locating my actual feminist politics is not you know um, a, a particular kind of like exclusive one uh, like that is kind of what felt like an egg cracking open or something to me to be like oh these are my people and like this these are my struggles and like this is actually something that I don't have to feel um, like is a shoe that doesn't quite fit or something. Um, yeah, I'll cede my time too. <laughs> I feel like um, my feminist consciousness was all, and, or praxis was always just present, um, learned through the women around me, my mother and my stepmother in particular, a lot of black women educators throughout my life. Um, so many of them, like they're like instances that I can like just recall right now in my mind, right? Um, because school was a space for me away from a very like, what was an unhealthy space at home. And so like, there were so many teachers that would like sort of bring me in and like create space for like caring and loving on me and other in particular black girls, dark skinned black girls. And I kind of like viewed that and saw that all the time. It was always modeled in my life. And I remember a time in high school where there was a teacher in particular who took like like it was, it was almost like another mother, another mother for me who put, I can't remember what Bell Hooks book it was, but she put it in my hands. And that's when I was like, sort of hooked. I was like, this is it. And I've already seen it, but now it's written and it's written in a way that I'm like, oh, it's not just us. This isn't just 
went off. This isn't just my story. It's embedded in Black women's stories across borders, and in particular in this space that I called home in the DMV area. So that was always it. And I think also in more, re in more later years, after my time um, in undergrad, because I feel like one of the things that during my undergrad times, that was it was just so clearly present. It's like women, women's presence, women, gender expansive folks were so like sort of excluded rather from the curriculum. And from, I remember taking a whole class on Pan-Africanism and not learning about a single woman. You know, that, that really shook me to my core. So like going into grad school and also stepping into a lot of advocacy work and working with organizers like Trinice, like so many other folks, really like delving into the praxis of what it meant to be taking on policy work as a black feminist, a black transnational feminist. So I'll cede my time. Can I also just say, could we all keep ourselves unmuted? Because, you know, it's it's the yeses, it's the affirmations, it's the moments of like, we're I all like, that. Yes, yes, and I feel you, yes. Um, so yeah, let's just unmute ourselves so we let's can, you know, tap into the conversation in a more organic way. Thank you, Nana. Yeah, I, I, I will say that Bell Hooks also played a formative role for me. Um, you know, I think I, you know, it's like, I didn't actually realize a lot of the oppression or even racism that I faced when as a young person. Um, like, I feel like in high school, when I first was kind of questioning my sexuality was when I first had to really think about my privilege, my oppression. And also I grew up in a very immigrant enclave, you know, like I grew up around Korean immigrant folks. So I was mostly you know, and like I had that safety until I didn't have that safety anymore, which is when I graduated. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like definitely like questioning my sexuality in high school was when I, when I first started really questioning everything. Cause you know, I was still going to church back then. Um, and I was very, you know, I grew up in a really religious household. So I think that was like the first crack. But then later on, you know, I definitely feel like the first time I felt like my ideas that I could relate to was definitely reading Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde. Um, and I think that was the first time actually seeing anything remotely close to what I have experienced my life experience at that time. And after reading them, you know, was when I wanted to also look for Asian American feminists and mm -hmm. how I got into, you know, this bridge called my back, which was actually like the anthology with women of color feminists at that time and was really inspiring to just see people come together like in their feminist identity um, at that time too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think this is always such a good question because I think that so many of us have like entered consciousness in different ways, right? Like over the years, like I really appreciate Nana being like, yo, I kind of seen this growing up. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, I was really clear about the ways that like black women in particular, like showed up in my life. I feel like similar. Um, I think of like moments of my grandmother teaching me about like Danny of the Maroons. Right. And what it meant to be a black woman in the 1600s leading a rebellion. Right. Um, after being like brought to this strange place that she knew nothing about and the ways that like her legacy has been able to transcend and like serve as an icon, um, not just in Caribbean culture, but in, just in black culture. But I think the moment um, when I actually came into consciousness was around the time that I joined my political home, the Black Youth Project 100. Um, and you know, our organization was created um, after the George Zimmerman verdict, right? That's a story of like how those hundred folks were in the room and decided that we were going to do something, right? And we were gonna be clear that our movement was queer, right? We understand blackness is inherently queer. Um, and I, I think that's also the time where I, I started to really interrogate the ways that I didn't see Black women in particular, trans folks and non-binary folks being censored in the same ways that men were, right? So this is a time when I'm like entering the academy, working at, you know, HBCUs, um, mm -hmm. doing a lot of work, like, you know, diversity inclusion, you know, everybody oh. loves diversity inclusion, right? That's what they say. <laughs> And like, you know, entering movement in a really complicated time where like, yes, we're absolutely out there for Trayvon. We're absolutely out there for Mike Brown and everyone else. But like, what about Sandra? What about Corinne? Right. What about all mm. of the other Black women whose stories were never shared? Um, so I think that like my political home um, has been very important, right, to how I understand myself as a Black feminist, reading texts like Punks, Bulldaggers and Welfare Queens, like mm. Kathy Cohen. <laughs> 
right? Like understanding and interrogating the Cumbahee River Collective and thinking mm -hmm. of the ways that like those women, those black lesbian women who people like deem unworthy and invaluable, like really kind of curated like everything we actually needed, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it just kind of came into fruition in a real way for me. And I started to interrogate the ways that like I was playing in the patriarchy, right? Like I was still in the patriarchy parade, right? Thinking that I wasn't, <laughs> um, it really forced me right, to break up with a lot of the ideas that I kind of got from being in, being at HBCU, if I could be very mm -hmm. honest, right? Like it is what it buying is. in, right? To that respectability and that elitism that mm -hmm. really shames like working class folks really shames international students who don't have the access. Um, and it really kind of caused me to like, take a look at myself in the mirror, right? Here I am thinking I'm big time activist. Nigga, no, uh, <laughs> steeped in the patriarchy and the elitism. Uh, and when I joined, you know what I'm saying? I joined my political home and it was a reckoning, right? To get clear about what my values were um, and kind of like who I was gonna be. So, yeah, I love this question. Preach, preacher, Lord have mercy. Mm. That made oh. me laugh, Jamie, in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is so black when you're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you in church or something. But thank you so much for everyone for um, sharing your perspectives. And for the sake of time, I'll just go to the next question because I think that it's so important because we're talking about immigration, we're talking about citizenship, we're talking about solidarity, we're talking about violence, right? And so, um, just for content warning, uh, we will, the next question, we'll be talking about uh, anti-Asian violence, right? And so um, the next question is, um, in your opinion, why are we seeing such high rates and in instances of anti-Asian violence? And how does this contemporary violence connect to a longer legacy of historical anti-Asian legislation in the US? Um, and if you can, could you please provide some examples um, to provide context? Yeah, well, I'll maybe preface by saying that I don't know the one answer. Like us, every every time I think about this problem, it's like so tempting for me to approach it literally from that academic angle that we kind of like have committed that we're mm -hmm. not going to because it's a way of like being able to distance from some of the emotional stuff of it, like the messy stuff of it. Um, but in my experience, I think in part it's because we have like a massive untreated mental health crisis in this country. Like people don't feel taken care of and don't have the resources they need to like on one hand, like contextualize and understand how to um, uh, like, what you know, when someone says something like the China virus or like scapegoats a community that can get interpolated in all sorts of ways to all sorts of people. And there's like very little grace that we offer individuals and like very little room to have them feel held. That's like one thing. But I also think that like historically and thinking as a historian, like there has long been a temptation to locate a problem in a foreign body and like mm -hmm. Asian Americans, Asians in general, well, you can hear my partner tutoring in the room, <laughs> but um, no problem. Asian Americans like are, I think that are like such a visible foreign body and there's this constant feeling of like separateness or newness and somehow no matter how long a community has been there um they are perceived as somehow like a foreign threat um and i think that this happens with like all sorts of racialized bodies but i can at least speak to my own like there is the sort of like where where are you from or like where are you coming from? But also the sense that like a community is changing the sphere, like the scope of what's going on. Um, there's a historian named Eric Tang who wrote a book called Unsettled about Vietnamese refugees in the North Bronx. And he writes about how like the New York Times has basically written the same article about like there are Vietnamese people in the Bronx. Like, did you know every five years? And like, you know, there have been Vietnamese people in the Bronx since the 1970s, since like refugee resettlement, like it's not new. But there is this constant like rediscovery and exotification mm -hmm. and like um, like it, as part of skateboarding because then we don't have to look at our own mm -hmm. dirty laundry or like America doesn't have to look at its own dirty laundry if there's like a foreign threat that has created it. And I think that is like the historical parallel I see. I think that is a big part of why there's so much anti-Asian violence. Yeah, I don't know if I'm sure other people have thoughts too. Yeah, I mean, I would add that, you know, clearly there's been a racialization of COVID um, as like the China virus, right? And um, 
that coupled with the actual like impacts COVID has had on um, us, right, as a society, you know, whether that is mental health or, you know, poverty. And I feel like, you know, crime or whatever, or yeah, what they would call crime and like violence um, rises with poverty, right? <laughs> and um, that I think that there is, you know, such a like lack of social safety nets that people are, you know, just feeling completely untethered, you know, and that like mm -hmm. um, seeing like the Asian population maybe as like the reason behind it because of the ways that it's been, um, uh, you know, like typecasted, I guess, like in media and stuff or by, you know, um, our ex-president slash, you know, his whole administration and still Republican today. <sighs> Um, and, you know, there's been even, you know, within like, obviously, like, democratic um, leaders and stuff like there has always been a lot of like anti like xenophobia, like anti Chinese sentiment, um, because, you know, like China, right, as this like rising global power. Um, and, you know, whatever trade wars that they have happening, I, I think that it's all just um, it's all just like coming to light. I don't think that um, there's any newness to the violence. I think that right now um, it's just once again more visible, you know, like I think that that's always what happens. It's just the hyper visibility of an issue. Um, and then, you know, how that hyper visibility also might perpetuate that violence, um, right? Like how after every single like horrific event, there's always copycats that happen afterward. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think that there's like a conglomeration of things, but then also um, to answer the second question, you know, I feel like um, America's like, you know, immigration uh, system was like based on anti-Asian-ness. Mm -hmm. Like the first, you know, law that closed borders was the Page Act, which right. uh, was, you know, anti-Asian uh, racism and sexism because it was specifically targeted to Asian women, um, mostly Chinese women, under the guise of um, all Asian women being here for potential immoral or lewd purposes, um, engaging in sex work um, for, you know, a number of reasons based on like perpetuated stereotypes, but then also, you know, the fact that there were also no actual um, jobs available to Asian women at the time. So, um, you know, Asian women did resort to sex work or were actually like, you know, trafficked into sex slavery. Um, and that, uh, but then like thinking also about like, right, how the US military has like perpetuated also mm -hmm. that type of like, um, like sex uh, tourism and um, the sex industries in Asian countries. Um, during every single war. So yeah, there's just so much I'm, you know, that's all I'm gonna start with for now, but um, I'll allow anyone else to answer or, you know, we can also keep the conversation moving. I'll also say that with the recent attacks and the violence that's been happening, we have to also acknowledge who's being the most targeted. You know, it is going to be the seniors, like the elders, right? It's gonna be, you know, people who, um, like the Atlanta shooting was targeting Asian women, uh, you know, Asian women at the spa and massage parlors. Like I think like in New York City, at least most of the attacks that we've also been seeing have been much older, like can't like those um, seniors who are like trying to recycle the cans, you know, like I think there's also a very specific type of Asian American that's being or Asian Asian immigrants that are being uh, targeted right now too. I think that's actually a perfect segue, right, for our next question. Um, in our praxis, in a feminist praxis, um, we know it's imperative that we interrogate those who are more advanced in the marginalization of our communities, right, like Julie was just saying. Um, when it comes to inequities on immigration, who are the most impacted in our communities? And anyone can jump in. Uh, <laughs> To like you know allow rhetorical yeah <laughs> definitely I mean well, def no. yeah. well yeah, definitely the <laughs> yeah sorry sorry <laughs> definitely the poorest of us those who don't fit within binaries of gender right so okay. those who don't fit within like heteronormative images mm -hmm. and like just hetero heteronormativity like so our black for in black queer trans migrants refugees in particular okay. those are the most deeply impacted by 
not just immigration policies, but also welfare policies, mm -hmm. uh, anything that has to do with anything that has to do with anything in this country are those deep, most deeply impacted, but because they are not the desirable, not just within the larger society, but also within the actual community. They're the most in they're the least desirable rather within the community, a lot of their issues that then their needs are just silenced. Despite the fact that these are often the folks who are leading the movement and who are, you know, literally laying, laying their bodies on the mm -hmm. line, they're sharing what little capital they have, they're creating spaces to advance the movement and really bring us to what liberation looks like. Yeah, I was just thinking, or I'm having this thought, like, as, you know, our earlier conversation sort of about like patriarchy and the invisibilization of both Black women in texts of black liberation even, like even when you are the subject of the conversation being excluded from them, that mm -hmm. is such a unique experience that I think speaks to some of what this problem is too, of like, we know that the white superstructure is not going to protect any of us, right? Mm -hmm. And it obviously trickles down like the, the poorest, the most vulnerable are particularly unprotected. That's true on like a big structural level. But then in community, we have all of these little pacts that we've made over decades and decades, hundreds of years maybe, of how we're going to keep each other safe. And there's like a really reclamatory, exciting mm -hmm. way to think of that. And then there's also a like kind of dark side of that, of like, how are we not taking care of each other? And who do we feel comfortable as a community excluding? And I think that's where some of that like class stuff comes in. Like we're very comfortable excluding people who are working for us or who are, you know, taking care of our children. Or I know in the South Asian community, there's a huge rift between people who came on H-1Bs and are kind of like skilled migrants mm -hmm. and their domestic worker employees or, you know, wealthy Indian folks who are employing Nepalese women to take care of their children. On some level, you know, we're all South Asian, but that is not quite the identity category that we're building solidarity across. There is you know, real rifts and there's a sense that we should be able to exploit our own to some mm -hmm. degree. And that I think renders people super hyper vulnerable. And of course, like gender nonconformity, not getting married at the right time, Ooh. not having a certain kind of like chat, like, you know, not having certain claims to community protection render you particularly vulnerable because you don't cease being a racialized person. It's not like suddenly, you know, the white superstructure is eager to take care of you because you're a queer person of color. It's just that you almost relinquish some measure of community protection. And that is hard, you know, I think that's just a thought I was having. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and that reminds me of uh, Kathy J. Cohen's The Boundaries of Blackness, HIV, AIDS, and the HIV and the Breakdown of Black Politics. And she discusses how in the Black community, like there's this consensus issues where people can get around because if we feel as if our um, livelihoods and our issues are tethered to our race first. And then there's cross-cutting issues where if you don't fit inside this race first masculinist, uh, you know, concept, your issues don't matter, right? So right. From, uh, issues of gender and sexuality and what constitutes home if you're a migrant, what like, you know, all sorts of things that is outside of the consensus, consensus issues and we can't deal with that. And that is why you see in the black community, particularly when it comes to state sanctioned violence, the dominant foci is on black cis heteronormative male victims and survivors of state violence, but rarely do people want to talk about Trans, black trans women, queer folks, gender non-conforming folks. Right. And this is not just a US issue. This is a global issue within mm -hmm. the landscape of what we talk about state and quotidian violence. And so I think that's why we see those uh, who are most advanced in our, their marginalization, not recognized, even like Nana was saying, we're at the vanguard of, of movement building. Um, and literally like, it's us keeping us safe. <laughs> like you were talking about Saloni, you know, it's because many of us have been pacified and co-opted to repeat the same systems and structures um, and thinking that, I don't know if it's our class positions, our societal academic positions will save us and it, and you will not be saved. Right, right. It's yeah. even, and even transnationally, like I think about what's happening in Ghana, which is not new, but uh, the, like the just this literal, like this attack of, queer folk, the trans community all throughout Ghana and like the sustainability that we see like transnationally with activists here, with activists back home, you know, trying to create space because there is this global commitment too. 
uh, um, in terms of like conforming within white supremacy within mm -hmm. like our governments, whether we're in the host nation or home nation. So it puts you in this very awkward positioning of your relationship to any which state, mm -hmm. which is why I think and so much of my work and my organizing has just been like, let me center this com my community, our communities outside of the state and outside of that apparatus because they ain't shit. <laughs> Either way, something like the one you came from, the one you're at right now is something. <laughs> Boom. Listen. I think I also was thinking about what I think I'm not sure who said it. I think Nana, you touched on it. I think Julie did too. Um, two communities I think of that we don't talk enough about are migrant survivor women. Mm. Right? Like mm. as a person that is divorced, that was undocumented, like listening to the horror stories of like other women around me of having to stay in marriages, mm -hmm. right? Being trafficked. And because we don't have access, right? To the protections. Yeah, VAWA is helpful, but not that really. Not really. Right? Yeah. Like, when you don't have the status that you need or the access that you need, where we're talking about an attorney, we're talking about the money to actually pay for the visa, right? To pay for the application that doesn't guarantee you a thing, folks are more likely to stay in abusive relationships, right? Whether that's emotionally abusive, physically abusive, sexually abusive, and the list goes on. Financially, so I'm, I think, my God. I'm really curious, right, about like, what that work is gonna look like based in the US. Cause I know there are folks that are doing the work in West Africa in particular around migration, but like we here in the US, when I think of migrant survivors, um, that's not always a conversation that we even can have because it impacts our status. All right, so mm. this is the community that I'm thinking about. Um, the second one I'm thinking about is folks who are formerly incarcerated, right? Or have a particular charge, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, think about the ways that we're criminalized and funneled into prisons, right? It's usually because we do not have something, right? We do not have access to a thing, right? So what do we do? We survive, right? And usually those folks are Black migrants, right? What queer, trans in particular, right? When we are thinking about the folks that are deported at high rates and also have to stay in those detention centers. Right. So, you know, it could be as small as that weed charge, right? Or small as a, as a theft charge or whatever the charge is. And now I'm more likely, right? To sit in a deportation center versus even being sent back to my home country that I probably fled from persecution in the first place, right? right. So how are we thinking about when we're having conversations about abolition, right? People need to also be clear that we're talking about the abolishment of too we're talking about the abolishment of detention centers because they're one in the same yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely who listen this, i'm talking a lot so feel free to like cut me off but i you know there's we there's these immigration hearings that happened in 1986, the IRCA hearings. And we talk a lot about IRCA because it's the laws that gave us like employment verification mandates and all sorts of, it's like this Reagan, right. um, like immigration reform that also extended amnesty to a lot of migrants. So it's it's a mixed bag, but there's a, a hearing in there about women who are, or I guess all sorts of migrants are technically being discussed, but they're talking about women who are, um, migrating as fiancés or on green card mm. visas and that conversation reading it was like so eye-opening to me about the logics of the state and how the safety of women is not really a at all <laughs> not a priority they're exclusively threats but also how imbricated like the fear of the like coquettish Asian woman who's like tricked a service member into oh marrying her and now you know these like tropes are in the congressional record senators are saying them like there are people from paid organizations who are sort of like trafficking in these stereotypes and how closely they're linked to this fear of like black welfare mothers who are marrying undocumented migrants to right. share their welfare benefits with like there it's the same fear this. articulated in two really um like violent ways and the solution is to force people to stay in marriages if they want their statuses to be honored to make mandatory waiting periods before you can even get a divorce if you want to keep your green card and not be deported they're all of these like perverse incentives that come out of the like Absolutely. you know exploiting of that fear and so i think like really looking at those documents sometimes is clarify to me it's not conspiracy theory like what we're feet like it's real that's how it's designed mm -hmm. absolutely and this kind of leads me into our next question, right? So folks are probably like, I'm learning a lot, getting a lot of information. Um, how can people plug in, right? Can you share some of the formations of Asian American Feminist Collective and also some Black migrant led organizations, maybe some of the missions, the visions and some of the work 
um, that's currently happening. So folks can like plug in and know what website to hit, right? Know who to follow on Instagram and know how to access this information. I can start with Asian American Feminist Collective. Um, as Tiff mentioned earlier, we formed after the 2016 election and with the rise of the Women's March, just because we were seeing, you know, we wanted to think through what does an Asian American feminist movement look like? What does it mean to be Asian American and a feminist? Like having those type of internal conversations were, were really important at that time. Yes. And so our mission right now is really engaging in intersectional feminist politics, building a feminist public, having the space to explore our own identity and doing political education and community building and advocacy. So some of the things that we've been working on, um, we actually just finished our six week long Kundiman, which is an Asian American literary nonprofit. We did a six week writing workshop with them. We're going to be um, publishing a Asian American feminist anthology with the writers oh. that we've been working with. Um, we also do a lot of political education around um, you know, cop free communities. We recently did an action on after the anti like all, after the violence that's been happening um there's been calls from asian american electeds and leaders to fund fully fund this asian hate crime task force giving more money to um nypd so we were trying to you know raise awareness about why that is not the way to go why that is not a good idea um and We've also made a bunch of zines. I think Saloni worked on um, a recent zine, we, you know, the COVID-19 zine. I don't know, Saloni, do you wanna share a little bit about that? I think Saloni and Tiff both worked on that. Yeah, Tiff, you can talk if you want to. I've just been like, I feel monopolizing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like oh. chatty today, oh. but um, yeah, the COVID zine was a really great opportunity for us to work with a lot of folks thinking about like contagion and epidemics and racialization and also what we can learn from community activists who've kind of like come up with different forms of care be it pod mapping and we're kind of like thinking outside of alternatives to calling the police um but also our like kind of disability rights community and folks who've been thinking about what does it mean if your whole life is not leaving the house and that's normal for you and like what kinds of strategies have those people created um, Tiff, I don't know if you want to say more. I'm, I'm kind of dropping resources in the chat, like slapdash, sorry. <laughs> Got it. Um, yeah, I don't know what to add. Um, we all we all do a lot of different things. Because, <laughs> um, you know, as you can tell, we come from like different sectors and we all have our like different passion points. So um, basically just engaging in Asian American feminism, uh, broadly creating a feminist public um, through different ways, a lot of political education work. Um, and uh, I think the most important thing is kind of just like also creating like just a space for us. Um, you know, as Julie mentioned uh, that, you know, we came up around the time of like the Women's March, but it was not in collaboration with them. It was because, you know, we once again felt like there was a marginalization and tokenization of, um, you know, Asian women, queer people, trans people within uh, the like mainstream feminist movements that were happening at the time. And, you know, what do, you know, we do whenever we feel that, you know, we create our own spaces. So, um, that's why it's been like so transformative, I feel like for me to um, just be in a space that was explicitly um, for and like by Asian feminists. Um, because that was just something that I lacked completely before, you know, there are Asian women spaces, but some of them are very milk toast, you know. <laughs> I will say that, and like, yeah, you know how y'all have been talking about like HBCUs and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. they are spaces, right, for sometimes like that budding, emerging, you know, like activism from within you, right? You're like, okay, I do care about like my issues. How can I plug in? You find like a national org or something, and <laughs> find out that it disappoints you a lot, <laughs> and then you're like, I need to create what you know the space that I want to be in because it doesn't seem to actually exist. I feel all of that. Nana, I saw that you dropped a couple in the chat. Do you want to share some? I can share 
Um, I can talk about the Indocu Black Network, y'all, really dope organization that centers um, the needs of currently and formerly undocumented Black migrants, mm -hmm. um, policy work down to direct service, down to organizing and have been getting into some base building um, and also political education. Um, BLMP is an organization that centers the experiences of Black LGBTQ migrants. We are a transnational organization. So we are organizing across borders. We don't believe in borders. We do a lot of deportation defense work. Um, that has actually been very successful in partnership with other organizations like UBN and the Haitian Bridge Alliance, but we also provide direct service um, resources and have been getting into the research field um, because Black LGBTQ data, right, is very slim when right. we're thinking about migrants. And if we want to shift policy um, and burn down these borders, we're going to have to get the data that we need to be able to do it and shift conditions. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, in the chat, y'all, I dropped um, links for those organizations that Trini shared about and others as well that do work around the country locally and also across borders. Haitian Bridge Alliance in particular has done a lot of great work in particular documenting the experiences of African, Caribbean, Latin American or Afro-Latin American migrants at mm -hmm. the US-Mexico border and mm -hmm. um, did work in leading um, a delegation, I think from the CBC amongst others to actually go and witness the conditions of black migrants who are not just traversing like that physical terrain, but also anti-blackness as it, um, as it exists in Mexico and the United States across borders at the border. So doing really significant work. Um, there's also the Black Alliance for Just Immigration that has also done work in publishing a number of reports that capture the data on this very particular immigrant group that is erased just historically, despite having presence here since the 1700s as migrants. And so a lot of important and significant work there, in particular gendered reports talking about the experiences of Black immigrant women, undocumented women. Um, African Communities Together also does great work, for, in particular in the New York metro area, focusing on African immigrants. Um, they, there's a great report that they did that focused on African hair braiders and barriers they have in terms of licensure and something that's not talked about often, right? Like, because people just think of the hair braider, they don't think of them as being undocumented or don't think about their circumstances and their status and how they're able to exist in this country and maintain their income in particular within all these different, like, just, I mean, all kinds of license for everything, structure for everything in particular for poor people well, you know, you got all kind of, I mean, I just, I'm sorry. I just be thinking about these things, these barriers in comparison to like just the larger scheme of things. Like we got a, we had a trash ass president who evaded impeachment, like, tw you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> barriers for everyday people, but like yeah. definitely check out these organizations. I have been blessed and honored to work with all of them really in like just research and advocacy and just also doing work across communities as well. So make sure to, to do that because we also need that support. And I think that's one of the things that's also significant about their work is that they've also done work with Asian communities and Asian immigrant organizations as well, because we both as communities face this erasure and also this, um, what's this, this model minority in, in particular in, in media um, and like even, I, I think even back to like shithole countries and the response to say that Africans are educated and this and that, when, why is that significant? We're here, we're migrants, we're facing circumstances here and at home as a result of militarism of the United States and imperialism, you know, making space for these diverse like experiences that we have as black and Asian immigrants is so significant to my work and the work of these orgs and the work that we're all doing here. Um, I thought, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I just thought I would shout out um, Flushing Worker Center, um, uh, who's been organizing with the Ain't I Will A Woman campaign, um, which is currently going after CPC, the Chinese American Planning Council. So this is some Asian on Asian violence right here that I'm talking about, by the way. <laughs> um, but where they've been exploiting um, for you know, decades, uh, home care workers who are mostly, you know, migrant, um, Asian and uh, Latinx um, women and also some men, um, but that uh, they're, yeah, right now trying to get back pay from CPC. They're trying to end the 24 hour workday because uh, currently in New York City, 
Uh, there's a precedent that home care workers work 24 hour shifts, but they're paid uh, only for 13 of those hours. Um, so there's just like a lot of, you know, worker exploitation happening right now. Um, and yeah, Ain't I a Woman campaign is, um, is uh, you know, doing a lot of work around trying to amplify these issues and demand uh, protection for these workers. Well, one thing I will say about Nana is Nana knows everybody and Nana is the plug for everything. Um, <laughs> I, like, I've never met a person that knows everybody, um, literally. Uh, but thank you. <laughs> you dropped that list. I was like, boom, baby. There's no excuse now. You got to go to that list. <laughs> right. But no, thank you so much. Shaloni, like, like Julie, Tiffany, Trinice, all the campaigns the link to uh, organizations and political education, like here are the, the receipts. Yes, you have the yes. receipts, we sent them to you. So, um, but I do want to ask one more question and then we're going to move into the Q&A. Um, the time went by kind of fast y'all. Um, <laughs> yeah. It always does that, right? But I really want to talk about the Black and Asian Feminist Solidarities Project um, because we always cooking things up y'all. But I really want to talk about the start of the project and kind of like what that means um, for us and how as we grow in our solidarity with one another. So it's kind of weird. I'm asked, like, I'm like asking about the question. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> and you're like, tell me your story again. Tell me, <laughs> tell me about us. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about it, y'all. Let's talk about it. So how do we get here? Well, you reached out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think when I think about last year, which is so wild that it was like last year, like that every like COVID-19, like I didn't, but first of all, I was like, COVID, I'm going out for my birthday. Well, I'm, what you talking about? I'm not, I, I didn't even really understand the magnitude until it happened. Yeah. And I was talking with my friend, she lives in Harlem, she's Vietnamese and we we're on a group chat and she's like, I haven't gone out in days. And I was like, why? Like, I mean, at least, you know, get some fresh air because everyone's cooped up in the house and, you know, um, you know, all sorts of things. And she's like, no, because I'm afraid to go outside because of the, you know, Trump and rhetoric around China virus and like the, the hate crimes that were happening. And I just was just like, wow. So I knew about obviously like black communities being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and just like, within the healthcare sector in general, like, you know, all sorts of things and across sectors in society. But um, I was prompted when she said that to reach out to the Asian American Feminist Collective. First of all, I saw the zine and we followed each other on Twitter. And I'm like, I went on the website on y'all's website. I was like, wow, you know, they popping, right? And so <laughs> like also I, I had a conversation <laughs> with, <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, I got to, speak with them, but also the conversation with Erica Huggins and Barbara Smith when I interviewed them and they pushed me to, um, I think it's important for us to have autonomous spaces like Tiffany, you were saying, like it's important mm -hmm. for black feminists to have autonomous spaces and important for Asian American feminists to have autonomous spaces. But they pushed me to be like, what are you doing cross racially, right? Mm -hmm. And they were like, you don't necessarily have to work with white women immediately, right? But mm -hmm. <laughs> What are you doing? And so I, I, I'm really glad um, the team said yes, because I was kind of nervous, right? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't know how it was going to be received. But then it just like, we in here now. So yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it more. Like what, how have y'all like learned about, how have we learned about solidarity with one another? I feel like I realized how powerful it is just to even see solidarity and action you know I, I feel like before even our project I really don't feel like I've seen that much um, cross-racial collaboration building um, just even recently right like just in my life so I'm sure like there were other before I, was, I don't know but anyways what I'm saying is I feel like it was just so powerful to just see it in action and just like even having the conversation it, it was scary because you know, it's like, we don't know, you know, what is going to happen, right? Like, we don't know each other, we haven't worked together necessarily. But I think there was this level of, it's a, such an important conversation that needs to happen. 
Um, and then, you know, ballooning into the Asian American Writers Workshop project and all of the responses after that, I think it just really reaffirmed how much it's needed. And there's so much that intersects too that you don't get to think about until you're actually in conversation, right? So I think that was really interesting yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was yeah. scared. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Before we had our Instagram live conversation, Jamie had called us and we all had a little like conference call and all of us got off the call and we're like, whoever this is, we have to work with her because she's so like night, like we really did have a call after about your energy and like your genuine desire to talk with us and like not instrumentalize the relationship. I think that so often, you know, like we've taken meetings where it's sort of like, oh, like we can work with these people or like, what can we do? Like, it'll be one event but it seemed so rooted in actually wanting to build something that was different and about like listening to each other and like having, I wouldn't even say that we have had like messy, difficult conversations in our relationship, but you know, be, being willing to hold space for those conversations because anyone who has ever talked about black and Asian solidarity in a public space knows that from both sides that like, Asian side, certainly I can speak to, there is a lot of like pushback or a lot of like, fear or a lot of anxiety and it feels like you're kind of going out alone into a space where you might say the wrong thing and you don't want to and you don't want to do more harm than good um and you just made it so clear Jamie that you were like in it to actually have a conversation and not to like be seen having a conversation and that felt mm -hmm. really important and like vital um so thank you listen it was great I was listen we already talked about this but I've gotten pushback from black folks. Like, why are you working with the Asian, like Asian community? They don't do anything for us. And I'm like- Of course you did, yeah. You know, like I be getting like messages. I'm like, why are y'all, you know, and not understanding the long legacies of history um, that we have organizing with one another. So um, yeah, Tiffany, did you want to say anything? Um, yeah, I mean, as far as the project goes, I feel like it's just really like reaffirmed, you know, my commitment to cross racial solidarity, especially feminist solidarity. Um, I feel like also through our project, you know, I was introduced. Um, well, actually, this is even before the actual project launched, but when we did our um, Asia Society like book club with Dr. Mar Margot Gazala Ray, I feel like my relationship with her that has like blossomed out of that has also like you know, been such a like an affirmation and like my feminism and my ideals and like I've learned so much through it. Um, and you know, also want to shout out other co-conspirators of mine, um, Kate Zen, SX Noir, and TS Candy, um, who I collaborated with to create this um, ebook, the zine um, that was all by like uh, New York City-based uh, sex worker organizers. Um, called but I am here it's but I am here.org but anyway uh that's just a plug unfortunately it's on Amazon I'm sorry um but yeah I think that <laughs> I think that yeah bringing it back to like also the like uh topic of like uh migration and stuff um I feel like it's uh, like you know working I think you know transnationally um and like across um across, I mean, in, intergenerationally and transnationally, like through the work with like, you know, um, black and Asian feminist solidarities. And then also um, through these like feminist dance parties that I go to with um, Dr. Margot Gazala Ray, <laughs> DJ More Love and Joy. Um, and, and, you know, like being in conversation, right? With um, your co-conspirator, uh, Neri Zapata from uh, BLMP, you know, like, uh, I think just like keep continuing to have these conversations and like um, learn from one another, learning from one another and just like really committing to like, yeah, have being in conversation and um, and just in collaboration, you know, like Jamie, you said it best, like sometimes they be Hayden, but we stay united, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah. in the conversation we had, it was like, they be hating, but we stay uniting, yes, okay. Listen, it's necessary, right? You know, like in the grand scheme of things, cause you know, people could quote whoever the fuck or say whatever, we could talk about these systems and structures that we're embedded within, imperialism, white supremacy, all of this shit, to disentangle from this, to like bring this shit down, is going to take so much work. 
and it's yes. going to take all of us all and of it's us. going to be lifetimes work like if you're in it you're in it for life not only are you in it for life you're in it to like bring other people in yes. to mentor folks and to also know when to step out because some people also don't want to let go and like pass on the torch like Ooh. but this is work and yes. it's going to take time and we need community you know i think like sometimes people want like the end all framework that's gonna like ultimately hit it where it's hard, mm -hmm. but this is like centuries in the making. And we continue mm -hmm. then in our, like getting to know each other across communities and being in solidarity with each other. It is a reality. We're all embedded within this. And that means that like, we're gonna have some tough ass fucking conversations and that's okay. Um, that's <laughs> something that I'm learning to live within. Like I've always been about that, you know, mm -hmm. like, listen, your girl been immersed in diaspora wars before that shit was on Twitter. You understand? Ooh. Like, it is what it is. We're going to get in the weeds and the mess of it. We've yeah. been miseducated about each other purposely, yes. right? Yeah. Education has always been used by a tool of the state. So, like, let's just, you know, I think for me, it's significant for us to be working together, talking together, strategizing together. We're going to be in it for some time. Yeah. And that's what I really appreciate about this space and y'all's work and just being here and just thinking through what solidarity continues to mean. Definitely not. And how do we have these hard behind conversations and show each other grace yes. um, in the process? And we might fail at it, right? And like, how do we pick up the pieces even when we are not, we don't show up uh, at our best. So um, yes, Nana, you got Samuel. Yeah, Nana, now you know us too. You know everyone, <laughs> including us three plus. <laughs> Not to know everybody. Not to know everybody. Knows everybody. Oh my God. First, now I see why everyone wants to. Everyone's like, I gotta know Nana. A hot commodity. That was yeah. Y'all funny as shit. I'm just, yo, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to get free. We just trying to get free, boy. That's and right. it's like, it, like for real. Like all of us have been <laughs> in the midst of it too. It's people we've met and known and seen in the movement and the academy that ain't really invested in what they said they invested in. No. And so mm -hmm. I'm really so. just trying to be working with people that trying to like, let's get us to that. Cause like, yo, Charlie. where's my MLK church fan? You know, in the church, how they have <laughs> like, where is that at? Cause I'd like to say after Jamie said, they be hating, but we be uniting. She amended it to they be lying. But <laughs> we be united. Lying. There's a whole, yes. <laughs> we have a whole dissertation. There are lies that we have know. to, yeah. Yes. I, I also want to say that like I also get it like I understand the animosity um mm -hmm. that you're met with sometimes right by like working with Asian American feminists um you know because like you know we've we've gleaned on it but yeah there's obviously like there is real like you know black and Asian like tension or conflict that has happened historically you know we might have some more context right not everyone has that context and I think that um, Jamie, you said it best on like an interview that we gave uh, together once. Um, <laughs> but you know that that you know it is all kind of about like education at the end of the day, where it's like if you're able to like have a conversation and like really get at the root of the issue, then I think there will be more understanding. I think that it doesn't mean that like magically, right? Everyone is on the same page. I'm not sure I understand. Hey. Series like solidarity. Hey. I'm not sure that I, I don't understand. know. <laughs> hey, <Siri. laughs> Yeah, and that, but also yeah. that you know a lot of it comes from also right still coming back to migration um, that so many like Asian people were able to migrate here under these um, what was it like the H one visa or whichever one that H one B. H-1B visa, right, that um, uh, was basically just for like, you know, professionals and like, you know, people with higher education and um, yeah, people from like, quote unquote, like skilled labor, like sectors and that, um, and so that has perpetuated, you know, this like model minority myth um, that, you know, all Asians are high earning, um, you know, East Asian uh, people who like chose to be here or whatever, uh, when, you know, at the root of it, there are many people right who are like forced to migrate and a lot mm -hmm. of people don't choose to like immigrate here including right. you know people from, who are asian right there are plenty of like you know like asian people who live in poverty they are forced into migration because of you know um right global imperialism and wars that have like uh, decimated their own economies like people who are forced here through like you know trafficking through um yeah i, I just wanted to like point that out that it's like it is because we are all coming from like such different levels um of understanding at first 
Um, and then also um, we all have like our own histories and how that like roots the way that we see, right? Like who the oppressor is and like, who is like a like comrade or whatever. And that, um, you know, I understand that we don't all have even footing and that um, I am just always grateful for anyone who is like willing to, you know, right, reach an olive branch and like have the conversation and, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just get into it. And yeah, solidarity in action, right? right. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, so I can't believe we have only uh, like 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, I know. So um, thank you so much, everyone. Like this conversation was is so fun. Um, and so I think Tiffany, like your point goes into like one of the questions from an anonymous attendee. Um, they asked, does anti-US imperialism inform your feminist approach to immigration? And if so, how? Since immigration is the result of interventionist war and economic collapse and global North neocolonial economic policies leading to the deep inequality between the global North and South that lead to people immigrating for better conditions. Come on, question. I know. I'm like, so like, you answered the question. Sorry. I, know, exactly. I, like, I feel like your answer was a really great answer to that question. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I kind of want to let someone else go. <laughs> yes, I think that anti-imperialism has to inform like everything that we do to some degree, because mm. even if it is not a frame that is like front of mind, it is shaping the conditions of like the world we're organizing in and talking about um, how we like even see each other. Like some of the stereotypes we've talked about, like those are war stereotypes that have come from, mm -hmm. you know, like a long legacy of colonial occupation. And it's always interesting to me, like, as a person from a formerly colonized place who is now, a, like, you know, living in a colonized place as a settler, um, there is like an interesting thing that happens about like how you find and articulate belonging in a place. And often I find that like diasporic people, like when I go to English spaces, I feel my racial identity differently than when I talk with this accent in New York City. Um, because I'm like more able to pass as like an American in New York and I feel less, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of saying a messy thing here, but I guess I'm just saying colonialism is like so important as a frame and structures kind of what you were talking about earlier, Tiff, too, like I don't know anyone who like wants to leave their homeland and want like even if you're coming on an H-1B for, to make a ton of tech money or something like I know so many people like that who are watching their parents and grandparents in India, like be surrounded by coronavirus right now who cannot get back home. And it feels mm -hmm. like crushing and scary. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that like money can actually make that better on some level. Of course it makes some things better. Like it makes some things easier, mm -hmm. but like there is a transnational loss and like grief that this moment has made so clear to me, even as mm -hmm. I rail against like some things that I think like imperialism is at the heart of that for yeah. sure. Absolutely. And I think for at least for in terms of organizing as well, um, a lot of the work that I've done is transnational and across borders. And I think a lot of that is modeled in particular, a lot of um, feminist, Black feminists and Asian and Asian American feminist spaces as well, because there's that recognition of the different spaces we're coming from, the way we're entangled within imperialism, the way we're set, uh, entangled within colonialism, the way the United States has been intervening and occupying and invading many of our nations and regions for like decades, centuries even. So that being, that's always been so critical and so vital to the analysis in which I bring to the work. And also just even like my, like just my research and focusing on education, international education in particular, because in particular, when we look at educational migrations to the US, the US thought of higher education as a weapon, an intellectual weapon. Um, there are a number of fellowship programs that they had that were specific to cater to and sort of breed the ideal leader that will follow in line with the United mm -hmm. States. I mean, if you look at um, declassified CIA files, there's documenting and like spy, like espionage that focused on like um, Latin American, Caribbean and African students not just in the US, United States, but in Cuba and also in the USSR, like there's always been a deep investment of this country in meddling in our affairs as migrants, but also as people, like whether we choose to settle or we choose to return. So that's always like really central to how I look at the work and also see how that is like 
general like model across um, immigrant communities, racialized communities in this country. It looks different and functions differently, but education has been a really interesting space to engage the state and it's very racialized, it's very oppressive, very fucked up policies and actions. Mm -hmm. Any, you just actually transitioned us, right, into the question from the audience. I was like, wow, Nana, how did you know? Um, <laughs> what are all of your thoughts on higher education? And how should we make sense of it in 2021 and moving forward? Mm. Well, just recently finishing up my graduate program, um, at an HBCU and I'm really starting to see how the ivory tower will not save us. Okay. Uh, um, they will not save us. And I think for black people who've been barred from having access to education, um, when we even look at the constructions of certain schools like HBCUs, what were the morals and, and, and values that are the blueprint or shape these institutions? And a lot of it is a lot of our institutions were created by white people. Oliver O. Right. Howard created Howard University. He was a white man. Right, you know? and our, so, our fucking mascot is the damn animal that he loved to fucking kill, they, a bison. A bison, right? And so, so cause how, not, listen, you know, and Janice knows too. And so it's like, we look at like several people who went to HBCUs and in, in, in our canon and they're prolific, right? But many of them were not recognized until they died or they were destitute or they were sick or if they, if they did not play along with the respectability political game, they were ostracized, right? And this is at a black university. Mm -hmm. so I can name you several, like Trinice can, can talk about it. Uh, when we talk about Lucy Dixlow and I'll let Trinice talk about Lucy Dixlow. When we talk about Polly Murray, when we talk about Kwame Ture, um, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, um, we can talk, the list goes down the line of mm -hmm. you know, so, and, uh, yes. And so we, academia, my PhD won't save me. And so mm -hmm. that's why my community education is so important. And even at the HBC I go to, the, the architecture is like literally to the back of the community, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so how do we talk about class positionality and higher education and who we are, who are, who are we serving, who are we not serving? And so we need to form our own community building, our own community spaces, to get the education out there. Absolutely. <laughs> this yeah, is such a hard... Way. This is just always, a, uh, I feel like I'm always sitting in contradiction, right? When someone asks me about, you know, higher education as a migrant, right? That, that was the way I was able to stay in this country. I just went to school. I was like, mm -hmm. I don't really want to get a graduate degree, but, you know, I get to stay in the country, right? So I think there's this weird um, positionality that Jamie just offered around class, but also like expectation mm -hmm. that's like deeply rooted in anti-Blackness and white supremacy that we also have to contend with, right? With our own migrant families, right? That like, that is actually how we're bred and you will go to school and you will do this and you will do that and you will become this thing for our family, right? Um, and it, it's a really, it's a hard contradiction to sit in knowing that it doesn't actually matter that Jamie has a PhD or I have this or, or this and that, that doesn't actually guarantee a thing, mm -hmm. right? So like they're actually, I think we need to really be honest. I'm really honest with the students I have um, in ways that I think could be harmful to my career. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I'm like, you don't have to do this shit actually. You really don't have to do this. And that's why we need the School for Black Feminist Politics, right? Because if people can access the political education and the resources they need to shift material conditions, what the hell do we need $200,000 in debt for, for a degree? Still work at the bank or at Walmart, right? Like that, we could have did that without it and got a lot more for it. So I, I feel like I sit in a hard contradiction and I see the value, um, but the value is really steeped in classism and respectability, yeah. the mm -hmm. ability to to move through the world in a particular way, right? And like, as a person that works in academia, um, I, I sit in that contradiction in a very like complicated way, but also understand that like people, especially people of color have had always had to navigate survival in ways that have, mm, you know what I'm saying? Really tugged at the contradictions and the values that we hold. So I think that's my response. And I'm really curious about how, how y'all are feeling about the question. I have one thought, which is that I feel very much the same as you as like my PhD is not going to save me. In fact, getting my PhD makes that clearer and clearer to me every day because it is an it's an experience of like being able to analyze the boot that's coming down on you really well. 
like mm-hmm. I can see what's happening as it's happening and it like it doesn't <laughs> feel good right because I know it like I'm not going into it ignorant or like not so that is a unique and shitty thing about this and I am recently I've been like thinking about like is it higher education that I hate or these ways that it's been mm. like commodified mm-hmm. and sold to people and like their little fiefdoms of personality even among the like radicals we're told to respect and like dynamics that allow people to abuse each other like I can you know whatever there's a whole litany of things but I do love talking about books and ideas and the idea that that can only happen in some places is what has driven you know I like didn't like any of my jobs until I was able to like sit around and talk about books and even when I'm fighting with like white men in my class I'm getting something out of it like that's what makes me feel a fire is like reading about and Mm -hmm. talking about ideas and like feeling like I'm able to write truth to power like we've all kind of described liking our work so I think there needs to be space for that like I want there to be space for people to spend years and years researching something that not that many people think they care about. Like, I do think there's like value in that. And school gave me an inner life. Like it gave me a capacity to appreciate novels and like go to an art museum and spend an afternoon there and feel, you know, feel many things. I'm not saying that it's like some experience of transcendent joy that is not without complication in those spaces, but like it has allowed me to ask questions just for the sake of asking them. and. Growing up, I didn't always feel like I could ask questions just to like contemplate them. There had to be a reason or a practical thing that was tied to it. And so something about getting a humanities degree has given me permission to act like I'm, you know, like there's something, and you know, I would feel that all the time when I came home, like, who do you think you are? Or like, why do you think these questions are like, they're not relevant. You're in your ivory tower, you're in a cloud, like real people have real problems. That's all true, but being able to ask those questions felt like freedom to me also. So yes. I just kind of want to make space for all of that. Yes. Absolutely. And the spaces that we make while we're in these institutions, like Trinice, I think about you, the work that you do at your center with your students, like that is like truly probably some of the most liberatory space they've ever been and engaged in. Like, honestly, like for real, like those experiences, I think many of us, I think of my own experience in college, like as first gen college student coming from working poor family, not really knowing all, not knowing much of anything, how to navigate it, what I needed, like in thinking of those spaces where I felt freedom, where I learned things and I was like, shit, like this has changed my life and my viewpoint on so many things. And I think we reproduce that as well. I think that's significant. There is something within the within higher ed that does keep me there. Yes. Despite all the bullshit, because everywhere you go, nonprofits be bullshit. <laughs> you know, everywhere the, there are people in a movement within movement politics that are bullshitting. The bullshit. media is bullshit. Writing space can be bullshit. All of it, right? Because these places mirror the larger society we in. Okay. You know, I've been a black woman that's worked in multiple spaces and have dealt with massage noir in all of those spaces, even yes. the spaces that said they wanted us to get free. Mm. So for me, it's like, where can I create a space where I can? create an experience for myself and for others where they feel like they can see themselves yes. and that we can also just get access to a lot of these um tools these re- resources these skills these artifacts like honestly some of this shit boy i just want to get this article get all these articles get all these <laughs> books make copies hold on to them because that's what i do that's what i do because they got paywalls on everything like white supremacy is not a game like for real so for me, it's like, while I'm in this mug, even though I can't stand these bad moves, I'm going to get what I can and get it to the folks that need to get it. And that's that's just where I'm staying right now. And that goes into like, Nana, I mean, what everyone was saying goes into like why the School for Black Feminist Politics was even started, why Black Women Radicals was even started, because I study a very unique subfield at an HBCU, and it's the only place in the world where they teach um, black politics, or you can major in minor, excuse me, in black politics at that HBCU. And like Anana said earlier, how can we talk, talk about black politics and not talk about black trans women, black queer folks, black, like even cis black women, like there was nothing, right? And gender expansive people. And so that is why Black More Radicals was started, but also why the School for Black Feminist Politics was started last year in October 2020. And I just want to be frank, I was tired of my friends, whether they were in academia or not getting shitted on, because I know so many brilliant Black feminists. And it's like, you're studying 
Afro-Austrian women's radical political struggles and these people are not taking you seriously? Or we're not taught, like, I mean, it's so much. And so that is why the School for Black Feminist Politics was started to empower Black feminists and to, uh, Black feminisms and to expand the frame of reference of Black politics through the power of Black, black feminism. So if you could please donate and support please. the Open School. Uh, and we're looking to own. I mean, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Harriet's bookshop in Philadelphia, but she's renting and she said renting is a form of sharecropping. And it is because if you're too radical in a space, they will boot you out. We would like to own and reclaim um, spaces in Chocolate City because we are tired of our people um, being um, displaced in a city that they built. Um, and that's rightfully theirs. Um, and then, yes, we acknowledge indigenous communities as well, um, but really recognizing the power of Black reclamation and resiliency in Washington, D.C. So mm -hmm. please support the school. Um, this is where we, we get busy. Uh, so yes. yes, yes, yes. But yeah, go ahead, Trinice. I'm sorry, I want to let you end. Uh, let's honor Trinice, y'all, because she's a creative director. Yeah. That I campaign. I know I didn't want to, I know I, I'm probably making you embarrassed, but I just want to honor you, <laughs> Trinice, because you're really popping and you do so much and you're so like, you're so gracious. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you so much, Jamie. We did not talk about that. <laughs> I, appreciate <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, just wanting to say thank you to all of you. This has felt like just a conversation that I would be in my living room with Prosecco, right? Like we would just be talking and like just yeah. being together in the most communal way. And I hope one day we could do that. Serene, check that. I got vaccinated. Yes. Don't know if that's good or Me bad. Me too. It might help. I am in my <laughs> living room. We just need you and Prosecco. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I have a deck. You I'm going to bring some rum, y'all. Ooh. I want me some Ray and nephew, personally. <laughs> Oh, me, not me, not me, please. Ah. <laughs> just, just thank you, like all of you for your brilliance. I'm hoping that folks, you know, were on this call tonight, like who have never heard of this content, right? Don't know who any of us are, don't know the organizations, right? That's the, actually the goal of this project that I support black women, right? Being really clear that political education is important and, you know, we're using fashion arts and culture as a vehicle, right? That's why Virgil said, yes, of course, I'm gonna support this idea. Do what you want, do what you need to do. Right, so you're gonna see a lot coming from us. In May, we're kicking off our next conversation. Um, and then July, we have a really big announcement. We're gonna host another Defend Black Women March that folks will have an opportunity to learn about. But just thank you to all of you who are able to make it. You'll also be able to access this on the Black Discourse page. You can follow Black Women Radicals, follow Black Discourse, follow all of these really bomb speakers that were here tonight to learn more about their work, to learn more about their life. Um, and we just say thank you. Please keep in touch with the campaign. Um, it doesn't matter how much you give, to the School for Black Feminist Politics, what's important is that you give. I see a lot of people commenting about, you know, pushing back and offering critiques around academic spaces. Well, this is exactly why we're creating this school, right? This is gonna be a non-academic space that's committed to deep radical study, right? Where degrees don't matter, right? It's actually the information that you access to shift and improve material conditions for marginalized people. Um, and that is the business of this work that we're doing. And just thank you so much. Does, does, do you all have any events coming up that people can follow you? Anything coming up that we want to share with folks so they can plug in? Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, we do have another column coming out in our Black and Asian Solidarities column. That'll, that's for sure be there. Yeah. That'll let you drop the event right for our event next week too. Actually, I don't even know where it is. Oh, yeah. And also we have on um, May 4th, a uh, Asian American feminist teaching on imagining cop-free communities. So um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just uh, in response to, of course, you know, what's been happening with the um, anti-Asian violence and the calls for hate crime legislation and funding for um, Asian hate crime task force. Uh, so yeah, some education around that issue. Um, I know Saloni is going to be on a Why Not Yang panel, <laughs> if anyone's yes. interested in the- Anyone's- uh, <laughs> race. New York City politics. <laughs> yes. New York City politics. You could just DM me and we could talk about that too. I'm happy uh, to. So I'm slide in her DM, slide in her DM. <laughs> Open invite, <laughs> yeah. With consent, of course. With consent. <laughs> 
Well, yes. thank you so much. Thank you all for having us. This has felt like such a lovely space. And like, I'm, Janice, you said this at the beginning, but like, I'm just trying to not be on Zoom most of the time. And this okay. was like, not draining. It was like really lovely and nourishing. So I appreciate it. I think we all appreciate it. Yeah, it was real lit. Thank y'all so much for having us. Um, I shared some links in the chat. So I write as well. And this summer I'm writing with Amaka Studio. I love, I really love the platform. And I'm gonna be like touching on African, African diaspora feminists and organizers and their different projects. So definitely keep up there. They're also having a free festival, virtual festival, May 2nd to 4th that centers Black uh, Pan-African womanhood. There are sessions on mental health, fashion, books, reading, just politics, just all the different things, all the different parts of our life. And it's going to be really dope. Wow. So check it out. Oh yeah. my gosh, I know I will. That's okay. so great. Yeah, and one more thing. Sorry, tomorrow Black My Radicals will be having an Instagram Live with Brianna Baker on protecting Black girlhood. Um, Brianna Baker is the founder and executive director of Justice for Black Girls. So um, we're just going to honor um, how we can, or discuss how we can protect Black girlhood um, at this time. Thank you for that. Thanks y'all so much. Hope to see folks soon. Um, we have your email addresses. So folks that have registered, we're going to keep following up with you to ensure that you know about the events and everything that's happening. And we want y'all to have a good evening and be safe. Thank you. It was lit. Thank you all. Yeah, it was lit, man. Thank y'all for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Everybody, Thank let's you stay connected. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Black Discourse. Thank you, Thank you yeah. everyone. Bye. 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 B